Rochester Crozier Divinity School has colored so much of my early experience, my childhood, and it is both strange and fitting to be here with you. I want to begin first by saying thank you. It is always a privilege when you're asked to come anywhere that you didn't have to invite me. And so it's special to be here. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Angela Sims, uh, to the president and Courtney and so many of you. It is wonderful to see old friends and new friends to have my colleagues uh, here as well and to have my parents here with me as well who began this journey at CRCDS with me uh, so long ago. And so uh, this feels wonderful as well. I want to begin with prayer, if you will allow. Dear God, wise one, thank you for this time, for this day, an hour of remembrance where we can reflect on the road that you have brought us over. Thank you for this time that you would open hearts and ears to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The scripture reading for today is from Luke, the 24th chapter and the 32nd verse. And it reads as follows, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? My subject today, remember the road. Remember the road. And so, You'll have to talk to me. I'm not used to a quiet presbyter as, as, a, as a child of the Holiness Pentecostal Church. I'll need you to say amen every once in a while. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then we'll get on out of here. Okay. <laughs> Remember the road. It's always on the road home, when you grow the most reflective, when you begin to remember all of the moments that made you, all of the moments that led you back home. We drove up just a few days ago, and that was me, remembering. I can still remember this city, Rochester, the home of my birth. I can remember 654 North Goodman Street, just down the road, the House of God Church. I remember singing in the choir, playing in the parking lot. I remember Frederick Douglass Middle School when Mrs. Irish Bannister was still a house administrator. I remember attending preaching classes in Colgate's Auditorium with my father in the Black Church Studies program. I can still hear Reverend B.W. Smith's groveling voice declaring that some preachers had a burning, but not a learning. <laughs> <laughs> I can still hear the chorus of amens and ouches. I can remember my call to ministry years later, the sheer fear of what do you do next and the answer coming back so quick, clearly calling me back to this place, remembering of course you go to seminary to caution me against becoming one of those preachers that BW had spoken of. I remember being invited to sit on a panel discussion at Colgate my senior year of high school in early 2000, and a new faculty member at Colgate also sat on that panel with me, a bright young professor who had just graduated from Union Theological Seminary and was still a few years out from writing the seminal text, 
symbolic blackness and ethnic difference and early Christian literature. New Testament professor, Dr. Gay Byron. She was and will always be in my mind as they say all of the things. Later, I remember in seminary, so many of us marveling as students at her intellect. But first, from the first moment that I met her up until the last day that I saw her in this life, I knew of her unceasing kindness. She had a scholarly, womanist kind of hospitality. She graciously welcomed so many of us into this work of religious learning, orchestrating even my first scholarly publication. And she welcomed us into her own work, into her own process, into her own scholarly evolution. The last time we talked, I remember her saying, with a kind of fire in her eyes, she said, my mentor says, always remember that you are a researcher. And she said, at my heart, I am a researcher first, and I still have questions. Mm -hmm. I remember her as a woman out on the road, still burning and still learning. Yeah. And that, this afternoon, is, is really my entry point into this text. I entered this text today somewhere between grief and gratitude. Out on the road to Emmaus, on the road with questions and curiosity. And it is precisely the point at which we find another woman on the road in the text. Well, oh wait, just a minute. You don't remember a woman on the road, do you? That's funny because the text never mentions that there was a man on the road, and yet we assume, as has traditional historizing of the New Testament text, that the two people on the road represent Cleophas and his friend. Just as likely is the point raised, however, by other biblical scholars that Cleophas and his wife, after witnessing the crucifixion and grieving with the family had started back home. They are in fact making a home together, they must be, because they invite Jesus back to their home to break bread, but who is it that butters the bread? Who is it that bakes the bread? Who is it that does the traditional women's work that would have been done? Why would you invite somebody back to spend the night? Who is it that turns down the beds? Who is it that will fix breakfast in the morning? And so it is a likely assumption to think this might, in fact, have been a woman. So why can't we remember the woman on the road? Maybe because there's a lot of forgetfulness floating around this whole story. Five times. The word remember or recognize is used as Jesus and angels struggle with these forgetful folks to remind them that he did what he said. He said he would rise and then he did it. The women are the first on the scene, the first to be reminded. They remind the men, but the witness of the women is dismissed. Further down in the text, when Jesus appears to all of the disciples, someone says, the Lord has surely risen just like Peter said. And if you listen, if you put your ear very closely to the text, you can hear all of the sisters in the room collectively say, no, he did. <laughs> the word. 
words of the Savior that you remember mm -hmm. the things which you know that we don't because we haven't heard them. Mary responded by flipping her hair. The emphasis and stage directions are my own. Mm -hmm. And then saying, I will teach you about what is hidden from you. <laughs> Mary looks back in intimacy and equality with Christ. It's amazing what and how she remembers life on the road with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also amazing who we forget was out there on the road with Jesus. We miss the women on the road because we have a history steeped in forgetting. Forgetting women folk, forgetting queer folk, forgetting the least of these. This is the sort of structured academic amnesia which Dr. Gay Byron, quoting Katie Cannon, calls relentless throughout the long history of biblical interpretation. Again and again, with malicious full weight of patriarchy, man chooses to forget to facilitate through his forgetfulness the subjugation, the oppression of whole groups. He forgets the womb that was good enough for a God to pass through. He forgets women that once preached the good news first, the Savior is risen, forgets a vibrant first century church that authorized women's leadership. But I stopped by this morning to tell you that what in a who man forgets, God always remembers. Yes. Yes. All throughout the text it says he remembers. He remembers his people in bondage. In Genesis, God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her work, her wound and songs. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. The whole of the scripture is a testament of God's faithfulness. Despite man's forgetfulness, God always remembers and God always yeah. shows up. Yeah. Yeah. And so there he is, showing up once again, <laughs> remembering once again, fresh off of Calvary's cross, fresh out of Joseph's tomb, and out on the road responding to the least of these. But then he finds out that when he gets there out on the road, the text says he finds them standing still and downcast. They are at their most hopeless moment when he finds them on the road. Launched deeply into grief, they have forgotten to hope so much so that even how they speak is in the past tense. They say we had hoped, but then hope died. Hope was beaten and hung on a cross. Hope died and was buried. We had hope. Have you ever been on that road? Somebody might say, I'm living on that street right now. All of America, all of our world is on that street right now with Cleopas and his wife hanging our heads and saying, we had hope. Remember when we elected the first black president? But then a racism so virulent was birthed and took office. We thought we had hope when we saw the spirit of protest that was birthed in Ferguson and in Black Lives Matter, but then it died in the lack of reform and more police killings and the apathy towards our struggle. It dies daily still in the rising death toll of Palestinians. We had hope, but somewhere out on the road, it died. There's this now famous story, you probably know it, the story of Frederick Douglass being in that place, being downcast and defeated in his efforts to free enslaved blacks. And he's giving this speech as the story goes, and he must have painted just this totally hopeless story, this hopeless prospect for blacks in America. So much so that Sojourner Truth calls out from the 
crowd those famous words, Frederick, is God dead? Which is to say, is your hope really gone? Has God forgotten? Or were the women right? Is the tomb really empty? Is the stone rolled away? Is God meeting you out on the road? Remember the road, Brother Douglas. Her question was the thesis of her life as a black woman on the road in America. She had done her research, you understand, and when they asked her, how do you believe the Bible when you can't even read? She said, oh, just look at my life. She had been out on the road with Jesus ever since she walked off of the plantation. She had a right to her questions because she had tried God and he proved himself in courtrooms and showed up for her in army barracks and tent revivals. She had done her research, you understand. Because sometimes the truth of the matter is that this faith gets real academic and you got to do your homework. You got to be faithful to your questions, as Dr. Byron said. I still have questions. You got to be burning and you got to be always learning. And, and here I close then with the question that Cleopas asked his wife, but you have to understand the sheer magnitude of her raising this profound question for herself. Did not my heart burn as he talked with me, by the way? There is this fact that the only account that corroborates and confirms the other stories by the earlier women is this one in this text. And I wonder if we are hearing less of Cleopas and more of the woman when she wonders aloud about this. I wonder if she is voicing her own question in the text. Does God speak to a woman? God calls women too, you know. Amen. Well, now the skeptic says, well, you don't even know if there really was a woman on the road. I know I was a woman on the road. And I know that if I didn't have text and if I didn't have enough time, I know I could preach my own questions. Like truth, I just speak out of the abundance of my own experience. When I look back and wonder at all of the places that God has kept me and all of the ways that God has shown up on the road for me. Every downcast day when the clouds hung low and I could hardly see my way. And yeah, I had some questions. Lord, why so much pain? But he came out on the road one day and he dried my tears away and turned my midnight into day. So now